the teaching that we had planned was the seven sneezes, the dynamics of regeneration. That may have to wait till my return visit in January. I don't think we'll be able to get to it tonight. If we do, I shall do so, but uh, time, time clicks away. It's uh, contemporary events in the Middle East. Um, by way of introduction, look with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. Revelation, chapter 12. Lord, meet with us now in the power and the presence of your spirit. Be glorified in these things. Let your people be edified in the name of Jesus. Quit for the time in which we live. Amen. Okay. Verse 7, there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels were waging war with the dragon, which is one of the appearances of the devil as the persecutor. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. There was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Satan does not have power in heaven. He has power on earth. He's the God of this world. Jesus acknowledged that. But we read in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, about the limitations of his power in heaven in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22. Peter writes as follows. Jesus Christ, who's at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven. Now remember, Jesus Christ is him on earth, but he ascends into heaven, where he's known as Christ Jesus. Having gone into heaven, after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him, the reign of Christ is established in heaven as we speak. He is Lord. <laughs> Satan tries to keep power in heaven, but he's cast down <clears throat> in a spiritual battle. God's armies, under the direction of Christ, led by Michael the Archangel. He's cast down out of heaven, but he still has power on earth. The world is in the power of the wicked one. We see this in the book of Joel. We see this in the book of Zechariah. He's the accuser. He goes before the throne of God accusing, but his power was broken in heaven. He has no power, no ultimate power in the heavens. He has power on earth. He will be cast down, and of course he will inhabit the Antichrist. The way that Satan entered Judas, Satan will enter the Antichrist at the close of the age. And I have no doubt that the events we see happening in the world not just in the Middle East, but global economy and other things, and the apostasy in the church are setting the stage for that thing to happen, and it happened very rapidly, quite possibly. The point is this. Earthly battles, what transpire on earth, are reflections of what happens in the heavens. Earthly battles in the theology of warfare, conflicts on earth, strategic conflicts, fights, military battles, they are reflections of battles in the heavenlies. They are earthly extensions of things transpiring in the heavenlies. Now we see this in other books of the Bible. We certainly see it in the book of Daniel and so forth, as we'll look at. But that is the principle. What you see happening on earth is a reflection of what is happening in heaven. Now most of you know, but some of us may be new to this, Right from the beginning, when man fell and God promised salvation, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. The descendants of Abraham after the flesh are the Jews and the Arab nations. But the promise of salvation is through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The conflict you see is that Islam says it's no from Abraham to Ishmael, Ishmael whose descendants intermarried with the descendants of Esau. Remember, when Rebekah was, was pregnant, God said, two nations are in your womb, Jacob and Esau. The conflict you see now is a continuation of a conflict that began in the womb of, Re of Rebekah, of Rivka. It's an ancient conflict that began in the womb of Rivka. Unless we understand how this goes back to the book of Genesis, you're not going to understand what is happening now. Now, ultimately, as Jacob and Esau were reconciled, we are told Jew and Arab will be reconciled in Christ. After the book of Peniel, the time of Jacob's trouble, of literal the father Jacob, the patriarch, 
He wrestled with the angel of the Lord, the one that rabbis call the Metatron. That is a Christophany, an Old Testament manifestation of Jesus. And the darkest hour of his, of his life, he, rest, he, rest, he wrestled with Christ and he walked with a limp. At that point, his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. Whenever he behaved like a spiritual man, as it were, a new creation, the Genesis calls him Israel. Whenever he behaved like an old creation, it calls him Jacob. Now that is true for us. He's an, the, the patriarchs are archetypes and prototypes for us. When we behave like new creations, the Lord calls us by the name written in the book of life. When we behave in our old carnal ways of the old nature, he calls us by our old name that our parents gave us. Everybody has two names. Well, this is exemplified through, through Jacob. I could say more about that, but it's not our subject tonight. Nonetheless, the conflict you see now goes back to the womb of Rebekah. It goes back to the conflict between Isaac and Ishmael. It will be reconciled only when Jacob says to Esau, I see the face of God in you. You would think that because of Abraham, Abram changed to Abraham, who the Arabs call Ibrahim, that the two people most likely to come to faith in the seed of Abraham, the Messiah, would be Jews and Arabs. Well, who are the two most difficult people to see get saved? Jews and Arabs. Satan has blinded their eyes to the promise to Abraham. You have a counterfeit Judaism, better called rabbinism. The false Judaism of the rabbis that have rejected their own Messiah are preventing the Jews from coming into the blessing and promises of God. So too, you have the satanic, and it is an absolutely satanic lie of Islam. Allah is not the god of Christians and Jews. Allah is a demon idol of an Abitain moon god. It is not the same god as we have, let no one tell you otherwise. Now I can explain the Arabic and Hebrew linguistics, but that's again, we have other teachings that are recorded on the internet. You can listen in greater depth. So what you're seeing happening here goes back to the book of Genesis. Remember, the Bible is like a loaf of bread, looks the same on both ends. The same imagery and typology you see in Genesis, you see in Revelation. And you see this conflict with Jews and Arabs at the beginning, and it comes into play at the close of the age. It's what is happening now. The physical battles, the literal battles, the military conflicts, are a reflection of things happening in the heavenlies. Okay, always. Now, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. My apologies to those who know this. Most of you do, some of you may not. The prophetic purposes of God for the church and the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews are crucial to the return of Christ and the establishment of the messianic kingdom and the eternal blessings of God. Okay? The prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews and for the true church. There is a hypostatic relationship between persecution of the true church and anti-Semitism, hatred of the Jews. The way I explain it is heads and tails. We can distinguish between heads and tails, but you cannot separate them. It is a coin with two sides. If they turn against the Jews, they'll turn against the believers. If they turn against the believers, they will turn against the Jews. I watched a clip yesterday by the Grand Patriarch of Hamas. He is not in Gaza. He is well protected in Qatar, in Qatar, in the Persian Gulf, far away, safe and secure. His name is, is Mahmoud al uh, Zawera, and he is at the moment in Qatar. And he was interviewed, and he said, don't think this is about liberating Palestine. This is about bringing Islam and Sharia, Islamic law, to all 510 million square kilometers of the Earth's surface, where we will have exterminated or eliminated the Zionists and the Christians. That's what he said. Now you have these ignorant buffoons 
telling people that Hamas is fighting to liberate what they call Palestine. <laughs> well, Hamas is saying we're fighting to Islamize the world to get rid of the Jews and get rid of the Christians. That's what he said yesterday. That is the leader of Hamas. That is Mahmoud al zoera The devil's the father of lies. Think of the Roman Empire. Who did the Roman Empire turn against? First the Christians on Nero, a few years later, 70 AD, the Jews. Always been like that, always will. Before the Iron Curtain came down, who did the Soviets persecute the most? Jews, born again Christians. Always the same. For centuries in their inquisitions and pogroms, who did the Roman Catholic Church persecute the most? Jews, saved Christians. Always the same. Who does militant Islam hate the most? Jews, Christians. That too goes back to Genesis chapter 3. They hate Abraham's and Isaac and Jacob's descendants after the flesh, by birth, that is Israel and the Jews, and they hate the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by second birth. And of course, if you're a believing Jew, congratulations, you have two prices on your head. But that is exactly what it comes to. We have to go back to the book of Genesis to comprehend what's really happening. Unless we understand Genesis, we won't understand what's happening or what's going to happen. Now we have an old teaching we did quite a number of years ago, and Arab believers love it, particularly people saved out of Islam. It's called Jewish Arab Reconciliation in Christ. It's available on our website. Again, I only mention it in passing, but this is a big, big subject in itself. The prophetic purposes of God for the Arab nations and his promises for the Arab nations that they're not able to obtain because of Islam, because of the curse that is on them. Well, Abraham's other children, the Jews, are also under a curse. It's known as the curse of the law, the curse of the Torah. More about that in a moment. Now understand certain realities. I know Christians, Baptists, Arab believers who lived in Gaza. They're not telling you that Hamas is a religious organization, Allahu Akbar, and it is part of the Muslim Brotherhood, which are Sunni, but it's strongly financed by Shia Islam. And the Iranians are trying to buy it to get it to, to become more Shia than it was Sunni. It was a competition. The reason the Egyptians will not allow refugees to come from Gaza into Egypt is they don't want the Muslim Brotherhood. <laughs> They're the ones who killed Anwar Sadat. The reason that the, when the Israelis it with Camp David, and when Carter was president with the Camp David Accords, the Israelis offered to give Gaza back to Egypt. They captured it in 1967 from Egypt, and the Egyptians didn't want it. They didn't want it. Jordan gave up its claim to the West Bank. Up until 1970, the people in the West Bank were not called Palestinians. They were called Jordanians until the tooth fairy came, waved the magic wand, and they went to bed as Jordanians and woke up Palestinians. It was all a political construction. Palestine had to do with the region. The original Palestine is the Gaza Strip. That is where the Philistines were, but the Philistines originally were not Arabs. They were Indo-Europeans from Crete. The people who live there now are Arabs. The ancient ones worshipped the fish god Dagon, the modern ones worship the Nabataean moon god Allah. Okay. But they live in the same location. They lived in what was Philistia. The West Bank was never Philistia. Palestine is simply the Latinization by the Romans in the second century AD. They called the Philistia, or the land of the Philistines, Palestine. But that was never the West Bank. In time, the whole region from the 
Jordan River to the Mediterranean became known as Palestine, but it was never ethnic. There were 30,000 Jewish soldiers who fought in the British Army in the Second World War under Montgomery, and they were called the Palestine Legion. 30,000 Jews from the British Palestine Legion. The original name of the Jerusalem Post newspaper, the English-speaking newspaper of Israel, was the Palestine Post. The original name of the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra was the Palestine Philharmonic Orchestra. It had nothing to do with ethnicity. It only had to do with geography until 1970. No matter what anybody is telling you, there has never been such a nation as Palestine. It has never ever existed. Never. The people on the West Bank were Jordanians. In black September of 1970, King Hussein of Jordan, who was trained in Sandhurst, that is the West Point of Great Britain, killed, massacred between 15 and 18,000 so-called Palestinian Arabs in 12 days when they tried to take over Jordan. He was a Hashemite Bedouin. But 70 to 72 percent of his population would be, have to be called Palestinian Arabs if you accept their definition of a Palestinian. So there's always been a two-state solution. It was always understood from the beginning that Jordan was the Palestinian state. King Hussein of Jordan who I met when I was 15, the father of King Abdullah, said, Jordan is Palestine. Yasser Arafat said, Palestine is Jordan. They admitted it themselves. Everything you see now in the mainstream media and in the UN is a constructed lie. It is based on revisionism, a rewriting of history. Before it was Israel, it, and the petition with Jordan, Egypt got the Gaza Strip, Jordan got the West Bank, or grabbed it, Israel got a narrow strip, okay, along the Mediterranean coast, and part of Galilee and the Negev, okay. That was the partition that was finally agreed to. <clears throat> anyway, it was always understood that there was already a Palestinian state. From 1948, May of 1948, when the United Nations established Israel, from 1948 until June of 1967, nearly 20 years, nearly 20 years, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Golden Heights were all, all in the control of Arab Muslims. If they wanted another so-called Palestinian Arab Muslim state, in addition to the one that they said, that they said already existed in Jordan. If they wanted a third one, why didn't they do it when they had 20 years to do it nearly? Nobody would have stopped them. Nobody would have stopped them. They never saw a need for one. They had a Palestinian Arab state, if you want to call it that, except they called themselves Jordanians and Gazans. The whole thing you see is a revisionist lie. The idea that Hamas is fighting to liberate Palestine, it's ridiculous. He said yesterday, Mahmoud al said yesterday, we're fighting to bring jihad and establish Sharia in all the world, all 510 square kilometers of the Earth's surface. And we're going to, after we get rid of the Zionists and the Jews, we're going to get rid of the Christians. We're going to destroy the Christians. That's what he said yesterday. How much of the media do you see reporting that? How much of these stupid students do you think are reporting it? Now, by stupid, I mean stupid. I used to think if you went to an Ivy League school, you must have been reasonably intelligent. Now I think if you go to an Ivy League school, you must be reasonably stupid. <laughs> These same students would say they believe in homosexual and lesbian rights. Do you know what happens to homosexuals and lesbians under Sharia? Iran funds Hamas. 
in Tehran, Isfahan, Tabriz, Qom. They have cranes, literally cranes, construction cranes, and they hang homosexuals and lesbians on the cranes in the street and they leave their bodies there to rot. I thought you believe in homosexual and lesbian rights. Then why are you backing Hamas? It doesn't make any sense. Oh, you believe in women's rights. Go on any of the women's rights websites. Women have been killed, killed in Iran. I've been to Saudi Arabia. I see the, I've seen the way women are treated in Saudi Arabia. For not wearing a lobster. There's women who are dead. I thought you believed in women's rights. I thought you were a feminist. You're not a feminist. You're a moron. It's unbelievable. Now, how can intelligent people with high SAT scores or high IQs or high performance grades in school, how can seemingly intelligent people be so stupid? Their intellectual stupidity is a reflection of something spiritual. The God of this world has blinded their eyes. The reason you see intelligent people who believe this nonsense, these students, is because the God of this world has blinded their eyes to reality. It's unbelievable. And it's getting worse. <clears throat> As Paul says, professing to be wise, they become fools. Well, let's look once again. Strategic conflict, military conflict, wars and rumors of wars are a reflection of a spiritual conflict in the heavens. Look with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God. Notice the real battle is always spiritual. My enemies are not Arabs. Islam is the enemy of God. I hate Islam because it is leading Muslims to hell. I have been from one end of the Muslim world to the other. I have been to Brunei and Malaysia and the Far East to Morocco. I've been to Saudi Arabia. I've been to Egypt. I've been to Turkey. I've been to Jordan. I've been to the Persian Gulf. I I've seen it in Africa. No wonder they want to come to live in New York. I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to live in the Muslim world either. It's a public urinal. Even smells like it. It's a stinking wasteland. I'm telling you, you could be in Singapore. As soon as you go across the causeway into Malaysia, you feel the oppression. You can be in Iraq in southern Israel. As soon as you cross the border, you feel the oppression. There's something diabolical about it. Now, I'm not saying it's the only false religion in the world, nor is it the only one that has that kind of spiritual oppression to it. But it's the most prolific. I mean, I, I feel, I get the creeps walking into St. Patrick's Cathedral. But this line is worse. Not one of them will give Christians and Jews the rights that they have in Israel, or America, or Canada, or Australia, or Britain. Not one, not even the more moderate ones. Christians do not have the same rights that we give Muslims here. But we struggle not against flesh and blood. I have a burden for the salvation of Israel. 
I have a pain in my soul to see Jews come to faith. My mother said I was brought up Catholic because of my mother I'm going to Baltimore tomorrow. My father's family, they came from, from Germany and Europe to, to, to Baltimore, but they were Jews who assimilated and intermarried. That's what they were. I, 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 they even sent me to the Jewish community center when I was a kid. Even though I was not in the Jewish faith, I was in the community. I had a burden for the salvation of Jews. But because I love Jewish people desperately, I hate Talmudic Judaism. It is a lie of the devil, predicted by Jeremiah, that blinds them to their own Messiah and the way of salvation. I love Ireland and the Irish people. Sentimental attachment to Ireland. I love the Irish people. I love Catholic people because I was brought up in that false Christianity because of my mother. In her ignorance, I was forced to go to Catholic school and all of that entailed. Roman Catholicism is a form of mental illness. Let no one tell you different. Talk to somebody saved out of it. Don't talk to some ecumenical Protestant. Or talk to somebody saved out of the Roman Church. They'll tell you what it is. It's the war of Babylon and Christian masquerade. I don't hate the Catholic Church because I hate Catholics. I hate the Catholic Church because I love Catholics and want them to know the truth. We have any ex-Catholics here? Must be. We're in New York. Put your hand up. Am I telling the truth? Yes. I see Hispanics, Italians, Irish, Polish, French, Haitians say that and don't tell you what it is. Because they know what it is. Because they were in it. And I know Orthodox Jews, even ultra-Orthodox Jews. I even have friends who are rabbis who have saved that, but they'll tell you what it is. But I'll tell you something in addition. The most Christ-like believers I've ever met in my life. They put most of us, including me, to shame in their walk with the Lord Jesus. The most Christ-like believers I've ever met in my life, in disproportionate numbers, have been people saved out of Islam. You will not find a better believer than somebody truly saved out of Islam. I've only led perhaps no more than half dozen Muslims to the Lord of my life. Of course, that beats the Jehovah's Witnesses. I can only count two, and it wasn't for lack of trying. <laughs> but they're wonderful people. They're wonderful. I love them. They're wonderful. No, I do not hate Muslims. I love Muslims. But because I love Arabs and Persians who are Iranians, because I love these people, I want them to know the truth, and I hate that which is misleading them. The lie you're getting in the interfaith movement and the ecumenical movement is, if you tell the truth about a false religion, you're unloving. You don't like Catholicism, or you don't love Catholics. You don't like Judaism, oh, you don't love Jews. It's not Judaism, it's rabbinism. And Catholicism is not Christianity. It's pontifical Romanism, pretending to be Christianity. You're an Islamophobe. If you'd seen what I see, you'd be an Islamophobe too. Look what they did in New York. This is the reality. We struggle not against flesh and blood. There are demonic powers on back of these false religions. You go to Williamsburg or Barrow Park in Brooklyn, where Hasidic Jews are. They're Kabbalists. They believe in Kabbalah, mystical Judaism, Zohar. It's demonic. It's Babylonian Gnosticism in Jewish packaging. It's demonic. You struggle not against flesh and blood. Those people in the Diamond District and 47th Street, they're blind by the God of this world. They believe in a Judaism that is not scriptural Judaism. 
scriptural Judaism has not existed since 70 AD. On top of that, they're in the occult. What is Roman Catholicism? Necromancy, bowing down to it. It's the occult. It's witchcraft. You've got mystical Islam, Sufism. It's a cult. We struggle not against flesh and blood. Look with me, please. The Exodus chapter 17, verses 12 to 13. But Moses' hands were very heavy. Now we see it came about when Moses held his hands up, Israel prevailed. And when he let his hands down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. He was 80 years old. Once. Then they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Now a lot could be said about Amalek. Haman in the book of Esther was an Amalekite. He was not a Persian. But Moses, but Moses had to be situated upon the rock for his prayer to be heard. The first requirement for God to hear our prayers is we must be situated, positioned upon the rock. The rock followed them, and that rock was Christ, Petra in Greek. There's no other foundation. But they had to help him pray. There's power in prayer. The most important thing in determining the outcome of a war was prayer. I lived most of the time in Great Britain, and I remember people from the older generation who were in Britain during the Blitz when the Nazis were bombing London and Coventry and Liverpool. Well, Britain is not a Christian country anymore, but when they were being bombed by the Luftwaffe, they all prayed. C.S. Lewis, he wrote the screw tape letters during the bombing, during the Blitz. Prayer. It was prayer. We struggle not against flesh and blood. Now let's look at this just a little bit more. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 6, please. 2 Kings chapter 6. Let's begin in verse 15. Now when the attendant of the man of God, the days of Elisha, had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he said, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. What are you, nuts? It's just us. I was just out west a couple of weeks ago and I made a stop at a place I always wanted to see, the little bighorn, you know, it comes to the last stand that almost started. This made the little bighorn seem like nothing. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw and behold, the mountains were filled with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people with blindness, I pray. So he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Then Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. And he brought them to Samaria. And when they had come into Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. 
So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. The strategic battle is a reflection of the spiritual one. Most scholars reckon that a third of the angels followed Satan. They're outnumbered two to one. To say nothing of the fact that God is infinitely more powerful than the angels combined. So it is. We have to look at conflict from the perspective of God. Israel is surrounded by powerful countries. But it was worse in 1967. They figured it was over. It was worse in 1948. They figured it was over. Guess who won? <laughs> Not because of the Israelis. Isaiah said the Jews would be regathered twice. They'd be regathered after the Babylonian captivity and they would be regathered at the close of the age. Jesus confirmed this repeatedly. In Luke 21, 24, Jesus said the Jews would be back in their land and in Jerusalem. Luke 21, 24. He said they have to be in Jerusalem for him to return and say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Or as our Catholic friends say, benedictum qui veni in nomine domino. Say it how you want it. They've got to be in Jerusalem for it to happen. Matthew 23, 39. As we will see, Zechariah 12, 1 to 10. Jesus, before he was Jesus, as the eternal Son of God, speaking in the first person. They'll look upon me in Jerusalem, whom they have pierced, and mourn as one mourns for an only son. Jesus himself repeatedly made it clear the Jews would be back in that land. Anybody who disputes what he says is either spiritually and theologically ignorant or they're a deceiver and a false teacher. Israel is indestructible. But they're not regathered for a picnic. In the Holocaust of the 1930s, one third of the world's Jewry and two thirds of continental European Jewry were exterminated. Two thirds. Two thirds of them, according to Zechariah 13, are going to be exterminated in Israel. Two thirds of the Jews are going to be wiped out in their own land. They have no security outside of the Messiah whom they reject. If you don't believe in me, if you don't trust me, if you reject me, I can't help you beyond the limited point. Open their eyes. The strategic battle is only a reflection of a spiritual one. Satan must destroy Israel and the Jews in order to prevent the return of Christ. He will not succeed, but he will try. When a tribulational temple is built, he will take it over. He will deceive them and make a false treaty with them. They've rejected the true Messiah, so they will accept the false one. Jesus said, if another comes in his own name, remember there are many antichrists, many. Jesus said, many will come in my name. But of the ultimate antichrist, the man of lawlessness, he will come in his own name. One of the ways, arguably the main way, we will be initially able to tell, or the faithful Christians will be able to tell, the difference between the many antichrists and the ultimate antichrist is they will come in the name of Christ. He will come in his own name. According to John chapter 5. But that is another subject. How be it one that's related. What you see happening 
is simply a reflection of something spiritual. It's not about Palestine. It is about jihad trying to Islamize the world and kill the Christians and kill the Jews. Because the return of Jesus in the agenda of God depends on his prophetic purposes for the true church and for Israel and the Jews and Satan must destroy them. There are even Hasidic sects called Setmar, they're in Brooklyn, who are anti-Zionists, who hate Israel. Deception upon deception. The Jews set their hope in Zionism. We're not going to have another Spanish Inquisition or another Holocaust. We're having our own country now and we can defend it. No, no, no. You try to defend it in your own strength, you're going to lose. Ultimately, in Zechariah 12, it'll be because Christ defends you. The one you rejected as the Messiah will defend you. Otherwise, you'd be finished. More of that in a moment. Well, let's understand what's happening here. Why is God allowing this to happen? We know why the devil is doing it. Why is God allowing this to happen? Look what's going to happen. He is a lot. The earthly battles are a reflection of the heavenly ones. What happens strategically is a reflection of what transpires spiritually. That is the theology of warfare. Daniel saw this. John the Apostle saw this. And they wrote about it. Zachariah saw this. You even see isolated instances of this kind of conflict. What was happening to Job was simply because of what was happening in the heavenlies when Satan was accusing him. Why does God allow this? Well, we know why God allows persecution of the church. It has become a necessary evil. In an age of apostasy, the word faith money preachers have turned the gospel of Jesus, have perverted it into a racket. The ecumenical movement has compromised the true way of salvation. In a persecution, those who don't need to be persecuted get it first and worse. But they are the ones who are the genuine article. Many will fall away and betray one another. Those ones following the word faith money preachers are going to be the first ones to sell the rest of us down the river. Because they've been sold a lie, we don't have to suffer, we're king's kids blabbing and grabbing. And when they find out that doesn't work, they will betray the faithful church. I will tell you the next ones. Those who have bought into the myth of pre-tribulationism. I know many sincere Christians who believe in that nonsense. But the early church didn't believe it. And it's not scriptural, more importantly. We're not appointed unto wrath. Wrath comes from God. The tribulation comes from the enemy. After the tribulation of those days, he will send his angels to harvest the elect. The tribulation is not the full seven years of Daniel's 70th week. That is another nonsense they've invented. But I digress. No! Persecution becomes a necessary evil. Think of the death of Jesus. It was a necessary evil. He had to take the wrath for what we did. Otherwise, we would be eternally doomed. The just for the unjust. He took our sin to give us his righteousness. He died our death to give us his life. The death of Jesus was a necessary evil. He didn't have to do it, but it was a necessary evil. Otherwise, we would be going to hell with the rest of them. Persecution of the church becomes a necessary evil. Clean out the dead wood. 
the blood of the martyrs was called the seed of the church in the early centuries of Christianity by Tertullian and others. Well, let's look at this. Why is he allowing it to happen to his own people? And remember, Romans 11 tells us they remain the people of God. They remain the people of God. Understand this. Before he became king of England, King Charles was Prince Charles, and in Britain, the heir to the throne is known as the Prince of Wales. His father was Greek, his mother was half Scotch and half Hanoverian German. He wasn't even a proper Englishman, ethnically, much less a Welshman. But he was the Prince of Wales. How could Prince Charles be the Prince of Wales when he was not Welsh? Or how could his son be the Prince of Wales when he's not Welsh? Because he's the son. <laughs> because he's the son. Believers become the sons of God, the children of God. They are grafted into the people. But the people of God remain Israel and the Jews. The natural branches of the church are believing Jews. Even unsaved Jews remain beloved, corporately, collectively, for the sake of their fathers. God sees this happening to them, and he sees Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I promise that. And God is a God who cannot and will not break his promises. If he has to break his promises to Israel and the Jews, there's no reason he has to keep his promises to the church. Remember, the church has no covenant of its own. God never made a covenant with the church. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant was made with Israel and the Jews. Jeremiah 31, 31, my apologies to those who know this. I will make, literally, I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The new covenant was made with the Jews. It was inaugurated at the Last Supper. It was a Paschal Seder. It was a covenant meal. This is my blood in the new covenant at a Passover. Non-Jews are grafted in. The church has no covenant of its own. If God does not keep his covenant promises to Israel and the Jews, the church is automatically finished because the church has no covenant. He never made a covenant with the church. Never. This is another ridiculous nonsense. Non-Jews who believe in Jesus and are born again benefit, benefit from the covenants God made with the Jews. Paul tells us in Romans, he uses the plural, the ethiki in Greek. Not the covenant, the covenants, both of them, plural. The old and the new belong to the Jews. Now, non-Jews who reject their Messiah are cut off from their own tree, and Filipinos or Norwegians who believe in him are grafted in in that place. It is true to say that non-Jews who are born again and accept Christ replace Jews who reject him, but the church never replaces Israel. Never. This is supersessionism. It is a nonsense. It is a lie. It's an invention of incipient Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, embraced by many Protestants. But it is false. It's not scriptural. It's not true and never will be. If God was finished with the Jews, Satan wouldn't be trying to exterminate them. There wouldn't have been a Holocaust. There wouldn't have been a Spanish Inquisition, and there wouldn't be what you're seeing this week. If God was finished with them, the devil wouldn't care. But if he's finished with them, he's finished with the church. Praise God he isn't finished with them. Let us continue.
understanding this reality. Why is this happening? Why is God allowing it? Look with me, please, to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18. Verse 18. The rabbis in the Talmudic literature agree. They agree this is about the Messiah. I'll raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, that is like Moses, who will give a covenant. And I will put my words in his mouth. And he, the prophet like Moses, shall speak to them all I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. The gospel is available to the Jew first by virtue of covenant promise. But Romans 2 tells us because the gospel is available to the Jew first, the consequences for rejecting it are against the Jew first. That is why their history is so ugly. Because salvation was made available to them first, rejecting the Messiah. Rejecting the salvation, the ramifications and consequences are against them first. They are under a Torah, a law they cannot keep. The Torah was to point them to the Messiah. When the Messiah came, the Torah was fulfilled. In 70 AD, they couldn't even practice Levitical Judaism. The Judaism of Moses has not even existed, so they invented another religion. To understand this, compare it again to Roman Catholicism. Judaism today is not Mosaic. It is Rabbinic. It doesn't come from Moses. It comes, it's redefined by the rabbis. Nominal Protestantism, Eastern Orthodoxy, and above all, Roman Catholicism. It's not apostolic. It doesn't come from the apostles. It co it's patristic. It comes from the post nicene church fathers. It comes in the name of Christianity. But it's not Christianity. It comes in the name of Judaism. But it's not Judaism. It's rabbinism. And God says to the Jews, you reject your Messiah? I will require this of you. Salvation was available to you first. Not to the people in Thailand, not to the people in Sweden, not to the people in Ghana, not to the people in any other nation. I made it available to you first, and most of you have rejected it. Most of you have rejected him, and I will require it of you. But he is faithful, and we are unfaithful. Although they broke the covenant, God will never break it. But look what the covenant says. Turn with me, please, to the book of Leviticus, chapter 26, if you want to know why this is happening. We have the Mount of Blessing and the Mount of Curse, Har Gerizim and Har Ibal. Mount Gerizim and Mount Ibal. But if you do not obey me and do not carry out these commandments, if instead you reject my statutes, if your soul abhors my ordinances so as not to carry out all my commandments, and the most the devoted observant rabbi cannot keep all the commandments, there's no temple, there's no high priest, there's no appointed sacrifice. Because the Messiah came and fulfilled it. You either accept the high priest who's Jesus, you either accept the perfect sacrifice, you recognize the real temple, which is his body, or you've broken the Torah. You cannot keep it. You can invent what they call mitzvot, good works, traditions of men. Fiddler on the roof type stuff. Tradition. You can have that. 
But don't call it Judaism. And don't pretend you're keeping my law. Well, it's look. I will turn. I in turn in verse 16 will do this to you. I'll appoint over you sudden terror, consumption, fever. You'll waste away. The eyes will cause the soul to pine away. Also, you'll sow your seed uselessly. Your enemies will eat it up. I'll set my face against you, that you will be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you. You will flee when no one is pursuing you, etc., etc., etc. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. It's reiterated in greater detail. The blessings on Mount Gerizim. But then the curse is on Haribar and Mount Ebal. Verse 15, it'll come about. You do not obey the Lord your God to observe all his commandments and his statutes. I charge you today, these curses will overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. You can be in Kibbutz Biri in the country, or you can be in Ashkelon or Tel Aviv. You're in a shelter. I mean, clot in Hebrew. I see them giving out food parcels. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the offspring of your body, the produce of your ground. They're murdering their children, they will be having babies. Cursed shall be you when you come in and when you go out. You really think you're going to be safe in Israel? That's Satan's number one target. Geographically. Until you are destroyed, you'll perish quickly. The Lord will smite you. They are under the curse of the law. Is there a way out? Yeah. Jesus became a curse. Jesus became the curse. He was judged. That's the way out. I saw people on the news in Israel. And I, I can speak Hebrew, and I, I was listening to what they were saying in Hebrew as well as in English. And one of the things they were saying is something like this has never happened before. We've never seen this. This is the worst thing. Nothing like this has ever happened in Israel. They're raping these women and they're, and they're chopping up the corpses. Never happened before, huh? Never happened in Israel? Turn to the book of Judges. Chapter 20. Sorry, chapter 19. <clears throat> Verse 29, when he entered his house, he took a knife, laid hold of his concubine, and cut her in 12 pieces, limb by limb. She was gang raped to death, raping somebody to death. Literally. Forcibly raping somebody till they die of a vaginal hemorrhage, and then you saw their limbs off and saw their body up. Who did that? The Philistines? No, the Philistines are doing it now. Their own people did it. The modern nation Israel has murdered more Jewish children than Adolf Hitler. The modern nation Israel has murdered more Jewish children than Adolf Eichmann. They call it non-therapeutic abortion. It has one of the highest abortion rates in the world. Am I appalled that they saw the heads off of those babies? And those poor soldiers, young guys, 17, 18, 19, 20, going in and seeing that? My son was in a combat brigade in the Israeli army when he was younger. 
And they, because he's a lawyer by profession, they transferred him to the legal court because they needed even speaking lawyers. But he was in the last Basel War. The way that, to see that gun debate, that would traumatize anybody. Decapitating babies. Well, go on the internet if you can stomach it and see if you can watch a video clip of a DNC or a partial birth abortion where you drag a baby through the birth canal with forceps, do a suboccipital puncture and suck its brains out while it's still alive. And when Congress tries to ban it, Bill Clinton vetoes it. When they tried to ban it in Illinois, Barack Obama led the campaign to vote against stopping it. It's not just the Jews who do it, no, the Jews do it. Of course I was sickened and appalled by what Hamas did to those Jewish babies and toddlers. How could there not be? But it's done every day, every day, with no clinical reason in Israel. It is God's judgment. 3,000 killed on September 11th. That's how many babies are aborted in the United States every day. God does not make a moral distinction. It is his judgment. I've been saying for years, the scriptures predict the destruction of the Islamic world. Even in the millennial reign of Christ, Didan, where Mecca is, is going to be a perpetual waste. God's judgment will come on Damascus, Isaiah 17. That is true. His judgment will come on the Islamic world, on the Islamic Muslim world. That is for sure. But in the meantime, Islam is his instrument of judgment on the backslidden Judeo-Christian world. Ani Elochicha. I am the Lord your God, have no gods before me. I watched the video clips of that music festival where 260 young people were killed. They came on gliders. Black Lives Matter put up a poster celebrating it, saying we support this. They came on electrical, electric motors on, on gliders, hang gliders, and killed 260 young people. But if you watch the full footage, there was a statue of Buddha. And they were dancing in front of the Buddha. Not that I should complain, because I did enough of it myself, but they were stoned on psychedelic drugs. Now, most many of us were before we got saved. I understand that. But they were dancing before another god. It was celebratory. What does the Torah say will happen to you? Remember what Jesus told the Jews. Don't think it's I who accused you, it's Moses. On the day of judgment, it is Moses who will accuse you. You'll be indicted and incriminated by the Torah, not by the gospel. The gospel is the way of salvation. If you really believe Moses, you believe me also. If those Orthodox Jews in Brooklyn really believed the Torah, they would know he's the Messiah. Remember, the real problem with unsaved Jews and Orthodox Jews and rabbis is not that they don't believe Jesus, Yeshua, is the Messiah. That's not the problem. That's the result of the problem. The problem is they, not that they don't believe in him. That's the consequence of the problem. The problem is they don't believe the Torah. They don't believe Moses and the prophets. If they did, they'd know he's the Messiah. It's horrible. It's terrible. God is allowing this. He is dealing with his people. No, he will not allow Israel to be obliterated. Satan will not be able to succeed in doing that. Once again, not for a lack of trying, but we have to understand what Paul meant in Ephesians about the principalities. Arche in Greek, Rashi, Oak in Hebrew. 
demonic powers over nations. Turn with me, please, to Daniel chapter 10. In the third year of King Cyrus, Kirush, predicted by Isaiah, king of Persia. This is when Persia was benevolent, Iran was benevolent to Israel. This chapter tells us a change was going to happen, and a principality, a demonic principality, was going to get control of Iran. When the peacock throne fell, 1970s and the Shah fell. Not that he was the nicest guy in the world, but he was friendly to Israel, and he's a lot better than anything that's happened since. Pasmavi. The Mullahs came to power. Bani Saddam couldn't keep the state. Ayatollah Khomeini came, and that's when this began. This mass demonization you see in Iran is this. At the close of the age, Satan is going to try to use Iran, Persia, to destroy Israel. Now remember, Persia in the ancient world was not an Islamic country. Their religion was Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism followed the Zarathustra, who was a sort of a philosopher. Now that religion has changed and they're into fire veneration and things, but originally, it was quite similar to Judaism and Christianity in certain respects. In certain respects. Some of the things that were taught in Zarathustrianism look very much like what you see in some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They believed in a conflict with the sons of light, the sons of darkness. And you can see the influence. The Magi came from there to see Jesus. Somehow, because of Queen Esther and Mordecai and Daniel, the influences of Judaism were in Persia and pointed them to monotheism. They had that kind of influence, sort of. Hence, as Isaiah predicted in Isaiah chapter 44 and 45, they were benevolent to the Jews, so were the Medes. The Medes are the ancestors of the modern Kurds, anthropologically. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar. That was his Persian Chaldee uh, name. And the message was true of one of great conflict. But he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. I didn't eat any tasty food, nor did meat or wine enter my mouth nor did I use any ointment at all until the entire three weeks were completed. On the 24th day of the first month, when I was by the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris. Now at this particular time, Iraq was controlled by Persia. Another story. I lifted up my eyes when the per Persia began in Mesopotamia and went to the east to the wilderness of Belushistan. I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with the belt of pure gold Abu Faris. This is debated if it was an angelic being or not. His body was also like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning, and his eyes were like flaming torches. Notice the resemblance of the appearance of Christ in Revelation. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze and the sound of his words like the sound of the tumult. Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. And while the men who were with me did not see the vision, nevertheless a great dread fell on them. And they ran away to hide themselves. Even people who don't see what we see are getting afraid, aren't they? So I was left alone and saw the great vision, yet there was no strength left in me. My natural color turned to a deathly pallor, 
and I retained no strength, but I heard the sound of his words. And as soon as I heard the sound of the words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said, Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words I'm about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. This appears to be an angelic messenger. When he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And he said, don't be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, the principality, was withstanding me for 21 days. There was a demonic opposition, a battle in the heavenlies. Then Michael, the same Michael who fights in Revelation 12. He who was like unto God, Mikael. The same Michael. He's in Revelation 12. As we looked at at the beginning of our study this evening, here he is in Daniel. The same Michael is fighting in the heavenlies. Notice the events on earth were determined by the conflicts in the heavenlies. Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I've come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision pertains to days yet future. Our day. In part, ultimately. And when he spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face towards the ground and became speechless. Well, this goes on and on and he tells them what's happening. And he says something in verse 20. Then he said, Do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I'm going forth. And behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. In the ancient world, you had a conflict between Alexander the Great, the son of Philip of Macedonia, who conquered the Persians. The Spartans stopped them at the Battle of Thermopylae, but Alexander the Great, educated by Aristotle, but trained in military warfare by his father, Philip of Macedonia. Philip of Macedonia was the first one who, who organized armies regimentally. They overtook the Persians. However, I'll tell you what is inscribed in the writings of truth. There's no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael, your prince. Well, that goes on and predicts things that actually did happen with Alexander, including his early death and the fragmentation of his empire and the four of his generals, from which the Seleucids would come and the Ptolemaeans would come and the Seleucids that would give rise to Antiochus Epiphanes, a major type of the Antichrist, who would set up the abomination in the temple and teach us a huge amount about what's going to happen in probably the not too distant future, maybe even in our lifetime, I don't know. But it goes back to this. Now notice Greece, the prince of Greece, Prince Valley of Greece. At that time, Europe was Greece. Western civilization was Greek. Everybody was Greek. Herodotus, Euclid, Archimedes, <laughs> Socrates, Plato, any field you can think of, Pythagoras, mathematics, astronomy, anything. Everybody was a Greek. Literature, Homer, it didn't matter. Everybody was a Greek. That was the birth of Western civilization. Under Caesar Augustus, the Romans tried to copy it and make Rome the new Athens, the Greco-Roman world. But it begins with Greece. Greece meant Western civilization. Greek is the seminal origin of Western civilization. We think of Greek as a souvlaki joint in Kipkidis. You know, they got good food. No, there's a lot more to Greece than that. Greece is seminal 
to Western civilization. Greece meant Europe at that time. Notice there's something with Europe and Iran. There's going to be a fight. A fight in the heavens. The Prince of Persia will try to destroy Israel. You go on reading in chapters 11, you see what happens. Partially fulfilled in the time of Alexander, up to verse 36. Up to Daniel 11.36, it was historically fulfilled. <coughs> but after verse 36, it is yet to happen. The Antichrist will come in the character of Antiochus and fulfill the rest of it. But it begins with a conflict with Iran, with Persia. The Persians were later known as the Parthians. They withstood the Romans. The Jews made a deal with the Romans, with Pompey. The Roman general Pompey to protect them from the Parthians, from the Persians. What happened when the Jews made the deal with Pompey, the Roman general? He entered the Holy of Holies. When you see somebody other than the high priest entering the holy on the day of atonement entering the holy of holies, it's a picture of the Antichrist going to set up the abomination of desolations. And Pompey, you know, Caesar's partner, did it. They made a deal with the Romans to protect them from the Persians. That's how Pompey entered the holy of holies. That happens again. You understand? They look to the Western world to protect them from Iran. And from this, ultimately, the Antichrist is going to come and they're going to make a deal with him. And he's going to once again enter the holy place. If you don't understand history, you'll never understand prophecy. If you don't know what did happen, you're never going to understand what is happening or what is going to happen. I know this is complicated for new believers. That is the reality. This principalities. These are demonic powers of the nations. What happened with 19th century German rationalist philosophy? It began with Immanuel Kant and then people like Nietzsche. God is dead. What was the result of 19th century German rationalism? It got into the church, the Tübingen University, and then you had higher criticism, liberal Protestantism. The real, original Protestantism Knows that. Nine of the 14 Lutheran bishops in Germany endorsed Hitler and the Third Reich. Nine of them. The individual Lutherans who were believers who went against them, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, they killed them. Karl Barth was a believer. He tried to warn He was a liberal who became a believer, or he became a conservative at least. And he, or he was against, some of them were against him. But the whole Lutheran church went down the tubes with Hitler. They, the Roman church helped bring Hitler to power. Another story. Hitler came to power and made a deal with Franz von Papen, the Privy Chamberlain of Pius XII. Hitler's coalition was with the center of the Catholic party of Bavaria. That's how he got power. He was elected in a coalition government with the Roman Catholic party of Bavaria. That's how he initially came to power. Pius XII intervened at Nuremberg to stop von Papen from being hung. It's a long story. But what did Germany do once the gospel stopped being preached? The Moravians were gone, the, the, the Pietists were. What was left? Liberal Protestantism. What did Germany do? Went back to the Teutonic gods. That's what the Nazis did. Churchill called them, he said they were, they were following the Teutonic gods. Churchill knew what they were doing. They will always, when you stop preaching the gospel, nations will go back to their demonic origins. You see this in Northern Ireland, the murals in Belfast, up at the Falls Road in Anderson Town. You see that they put murals of Irene, the, the Celtic hag goddess who demanded the blood of the youth so she could stay young and beautiful. And there's actually Irish nationalist murals painted on walls celebrating this ancient demonic stuff. 
And the and IRA, the, the, that's what they would, it's principalities, it's demonic powers on back of this stuff. Am I right, Joe? Right, right. He's a myth. That's right. That's right. It's always going to be like that. They're always going to be back to it. I've seen this in Lebanon with the Shia Muslims when they hacked the children's head open to, to, to celebrate the Battle of Kabbalah. They, little baby, little, little four or five year old, no, I'm a, no, I'm a no mommy, no mommy, in the rules of the abuse of the hatchet, hacking their heads open, making them bleed to commemorate the Battle of Kabbalah and the death of Ali, Muhammad's nephew. It, that's what they worship, no it. It's the same stuff, you understand? It's the same stuff. Where the female cult meetings were worshipped in Europe it had been Diana of Ephesus. It was at the Council of Ephesus where Mary was proclaimed the Atticos, the Queen of Heaven, Mother of God. Well, that is where Diana was worshipped as the Queen of Heaven. You see these things, you see when they put the grottos of Mary and things like this in countries like Ireland and Poland, that's where the female cult meetings are. You see it all over Italy. It's the same thing. The demonic powers will always come back when the gospel is not preached. Well, that's what's happening. These are ancient principalities. Allahu Akbar! It's the Nabataean Mundia. God is letting it happen. They are under the curse of the law. They will never save themselves. They will be utterly destroyed in their own land, except for one thing. Look with me, please, to the book of Zechariah, chapter 12. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Who is the word of the Lord? The Logos and the Septuagint, the Devar Adonai and the Hebrew. Who is the word? Jesus. Jesus. Thus declares the Lord, Yahweh, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundations of the earth and forms the spirit of man within it goes back to the creation. Behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes really to all the people around. When the siege is against Jerusalem, it will be against Judah. What did Hamas say precipitated this? When the Kotel, the Wailing Wall, was attacked by Muslim thugs who took refuge in the mosque of Aqsa and the Israelis shot the tear gas into the mosque of Aqsa to stop these guys who were throwing the projectiles down onto the west wall, to the Kota. It's Jerusalem. Ultimately, it's not about Gaza, mainly, or the West Bank, mainly, or the Golden Heights, mainly. It is about Jerusalem. Jerusalem, remember, is where Satan got his biggest defeat, and when Jesus' feet stand on the Mount of Olives, it's where he will get his final defeat. It's about Jerusalem. Jesus wept over Jerusalem and he said, Jerusalem, you'll see me. You say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup of reeling to all the people around it. And I'll come about on that day, I'll make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all people. All who lift it will be critically, severely injured. And all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. With the blessings of Barack Obama, UNESCO said the Jews have no claim to the Wailing Wall or to any of the Jewish holy sites in Jerusalem. They have no historical claim to it. And Barack Obama lobbied the British government and the New Zealand government to support the UNESCO vote against any Israel, Israeli claim to these places. And the United States of Spain, normally they would vote for Israel. Not this time. Not to be political, but remember, the world's number one sponsor of terror is Iran. 
the world's number one sponsor of Iran has been Barack Obama and Joe Biden. $150 billion from Obama. And by not enforcing the oil embargoes and the $6 billion on top of it, another $50 billion from Biden. We paid for this, you understand? We unfroze funds. We gave Iran $200 billion. What do you think they did with it? Buy cotton candy? No, they funded Hamas and Hezbollah, trying to destroy Israel. Don't believe the lies of the media. And I'm not being political, I'm only stating facts. I am only stating facts. I remember black African Christians, 3.3 million killed in 14 years in Sudan. And the American government hardly said a word about it. Who cares about them? They're Christians. They're only black Africans who kill all the ones. They said nothing. Christians are being slaughtered by Muslims, by Boko Haram in Nigeria every day of the week. Christians are being murdered in Nigeria. What are they doing about it? Nothing. Or they say they care about women. They don't care about women. They say they care about homosexuals. They don't care about homosexuals. They care about blacks. They don't care about blacks. They worship the God of this world. The Antichrist will be a God who worships wealth and power. And not in any godly perspective of wealth and power. But it will have its climax. Verse 5, the clans of Judah will say in their heart a strong support for us are the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The Lord of hosts their God. And that day I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot among the pieces of wood and a flaming torch among the sheaves, so they will consume on the right hand and on the left all the surrounding peoples while the inhabitants of Jerusalem again dwell in their own sites in Jerusalem. And the Lord will save the tents of Judah first that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem will not be magnified above Judah. And that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them will be like David. They're going to pack a punch way beyond their size and means. And the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. Who is the angel of the Lord? It is a Christophany. It is Jesus. And that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I'll pour it on the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. They look upon me who they have pierced. The same rabbi who has deceived the Jewish people to this day, telling them that Isaiah 53 is not about the Messiah, but about the suffering Jewish people. That's what they believe about Isaiah 53. Quran who comes on Tayeno, that's not about the Messiah. The rabbi said that is Rashi. Now the ancient rabbis in the Targum Yonatan said it is about the Messiah. In fact, it was in the liturgy, the Mark Zor for the Day of Atonement for Yom Kippur, authored by somebody called Eliezer HaKalir. But they don't teach them that in yeshivas. They just teach them what Rashi said. It's about the Jewish people suffering vicariously on behalf of the Gentile nations. If Isaiah castigates the Jews for their sin, how can they be the righteous servant who dies for the others? That same Rashi who said Isaiah 53 and 52 and 53 is not about the Messiah, says that this is the one who is pierced. Messiah, son of Joseph. The same rabbi. They don't tell the yeshiva boys over in Brooklyn that either. I wonder why. I always wonder why. I watched the Catholic apologist the week before last on the internet, and he was on about Peter being the rock. Upon this rock, being Peter, not Christ. 
Well, then how come your Saint Jerome who translated the, the Bible into Latin and your Saint Augustine of Hippo both said the rock was not Peter, the rock was Christ? Well, they don't tell them that. <laughs> In Catholic schools, do they? False religion always has to lie. Mormonism must lie or it would implode. Jehovah's Witnesses must lie or it would implode. Roman Catholicism must lie or it would implode. Rabbinism must lie or it would implode. Islam must lie or it would implode. These false religions are a lie and they cannot exist unless they lie. They're built on a lie. It is only the gospel that's built on truth. And so Zechariah continues. From that day I seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I'll pour on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so they'll look upon me who they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. The first time Moses tried to save the Jews, they rejected him. Only at the second time, when they were desperate, did they accept him. Joseph's brothers didn't recognize him at the first coming. They only recognized him at the second when they were desperate. And most Jews do not recognize Yeshua, Jesus, at the first time. But when they're desperate enough, they're sure going to recognize him at the second. You see, this book not only tells us what is happening, it tells us why it is happening. And it tells us how it is going to end. It tells us what happened, what is happening, and what is going to happen, and why. Fox News won't tell you that. CNN won't tell you anything but lies. The mainstream media doesn't have a clue and wouldn't want to know anyhow. They don't know. None of them know. But in the economy of God, we are supposed to know. There's a lot more to this subject than we have time for tonight. But I hope we've illuminated the present circumstances, particularly for new believers who are not familiar with end time prophecies or the close of the age prophecy to understand what's happening. Wars and rumors of wars. Notice, it's Ukraine, it's Novoro Karabakh, it's, the, it's Yugoslavia again. And in the Olivet of Discourse, in Matthew 24, for instance, what does Jesus say follows the wars and rumors of wars? Persecution. They're coming after us. Heads and tails, anti-Semitism and hatred of the true church. We can distinguish between them, but we cannot separate them. I was just in Wisconsin speaking at a church about a month ago. They locked up a kid for preaching the gospel right across the street illegally. A transvestite was entertaining little children with sexual perversion. Who did they lock up? A Christian teenager across the street for preaching the gospel. In Canada, they're locking up preachers. In England, they're locking up street preachers. Radical Muslims can get away with murder. Homosexual activists can get away with murder. Christian, lock them up. Don't believe the word fake money preachers, you don't have to suffer, you're a king's kid. If you're a king's kid, they hate you. Satan hates you. 
Don't believe the pre-trip people. We'll get out of here before anything bad happens. Yeah, come with me to Vietnam and tell, them to, tell that to the Christians I know in Vietnam. You should see some of the things I've seen in Asia. Don't believe this. It's all lies. The most you can hope for from the mainstream media and from politicians is a half truth. You want the whole truth, read this book. Thank you so much for listening. Okay?